Okay. Okay. So if people can um, can uh, block their stop their videos and mute their uh, mic. I'm muted. Okay, so I guess I'm. This is forward ho. <laughs> it's my privilege um, this evening to introduce Mike Burrell, who's a good friend to PECFEN, to Birds of Ontario, as well as to nature conservation in Ontario. Mike grew up uh, outside Waterloo in southern Ontario, and says he inherited his love of birds from his dad. He started taking birding seriously when he was around 15, although he'd basically grown up with a pair of binoculars around his neck from a very young age. He did his undergraduate studies in biology at Trent University and then earned a master's in at the forestry department at the University of Toronto studying boreal bird ecology. From 2001, when he was still in high school, and then as a university undergrad, Mike spent his summers working as a park naturalist at Algonquin Park, at Algonquin Provincial Park, a very elite opportunity producing some of the very best naturalists in the, in the province. After completing his master's, Mike worked on various species at risk projects, conducting surveys and collecting data for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. In 2010, Mike was manager of the Long Point Bird Observatory for Bird Studies Canada, and then worked for um, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry as a wildlife research biologist and biodiversity information biologist, before eventually taking a position as Ontario Important Bird Areas Program Coordinator for Bird Studies Canada, in 2013. It was at this time that he came to the library in Picton one evening to give PECFEN members a workshop on how to use eBird, an important citizen science tool to monitor bird activity and populations. He also was a very important contributor to our 2015 Point Peter BioBlitz, leading walks helping out with the moth survey under extreme duress with the thousands of mosquitoes that were having a feast that night. His lists of birds, plants, butterflies, dragonflies, and moths provided a great basis for that BioBlitz report. And the Excel files, Excel files of his observations with all the taxonomic information included were sent to me within just a few days. Talk about impressive. Thank you, Mike. He was also um, very generous. Uh, he's also been very generous with his time and expertise. Mike and his wife, Erica, pregnant with Abby, um, who's in the photo with her dad in the newsletter, agreed to lead a Peckfen walk, birding walk through the Hubs Creek Marsh during the spring birding festival in 2016, which was just fabulous for all of us who participated. Mike and Erica were in the midst of selling their home near Kingston and looking for a property close to Peterborough, but they still had time to stop in and help us out. Again, thank you. Mike has also given us presentations at our monthly meetings, most recently telling us about the best places to bird in Ontario based on the book that he co-authored with his brother, Ken, in 2019. For over 20 years, he and his family, AKA the Wim Burrells, raised thousands of dollars for Birds Canada every spring with their bird fawns, recording an all-time high of 179 species in 2019. Pretty impressive too. Mike always sends out a description with photos of when, where, and what they saw to all those who pledged, who provided pledges. Mike even counted a hundred species on his own property near Peterborough for his May 2000, his 2020 birdathon when he was self-isolating. Talk about dedication and an incredible birder. He's participated in almost every bird citizen science project possible 
and currently acts as the Ontario coordinator, coordinator for eBird. In addition, he acts as a secretary and archivist for the Ontario Bird Records Committee, is the Ontario regional editor for the Christmas Bird Count program, sits on several committees for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas third edition, and is a member of the Bird Specialist Subcommittee of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, Canada or COSIWIC. You might want to check out his blog, The Nomadic Naturalist, which has all kinds of valuable information for anyone interested in natural history. Since 2016, Mike has been working at the Natural Heritage Information Center, a conservation data center in Peterborough, and is now in the position of provincial vertebrate zoologist. Tonight, he's going to tell us about clouds and crowds, how the Natural Heritage Information Center, or NHIC, is engaging community scientists to improve knowledge of species biodiversity. He'll talk about the role of the NH, that the NHIC plays in monitoring and conserving species biodiversity, and how iNaturalist and the naturalist community play a vital role. Sorry, we're not meeting in person, Mike, but wonderful to see you anyway. And looking forward to your talk about clouds and crowds. Thanks, Sheila. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was, you, you did some research for that one. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, it's great to be back. Um, it would be nice, sure would be nice if we were meeting in person. I know when we started talking about this presentation last fall, that was, we were, we were kind of hoping that we'd be able to be in person. I was looking forward to driving down to the county, but uh, you know, here we are. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here. So give me a second. You have a lot of people attempting records all the time. So I, I think I saw somewhere on the website that they say to expect about eight weeks after submission. Okay, and I think evidence people to go through it. Are we seeing it now? Well, you're trying to inspire your kids to take. Y yes, we are. And I'm going to ask people to, to please mute your computers if you're not Mike. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Okay. So, yeah, uh, Sheila gave the overview of what, what I was going to talk about. Um, so, I'm, I'm talking about clouds and crowds and um, how the NHIT, which is where I work, the Natural Heritage Information Center, um, how we engage citizen scientists to improve our, our knowledge of species diversity. And I just gotta move this. Okay, so a quick outline for today uh, or tonight, we are going to, uh, okay, I've got, sorry, I was just fiddling with my windows here. Okay, we're gonna talk about what the NHIC is, um, where, where I work, what we do. Um, then sort of a quick overview of citizen science. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about eBird um, and it's why it's really important for us at the NHIC and then iNaturalist and then sort of a wrap up at the end. And I've got a few photos I embedded um, and I know they're a little small, the, the caption. So I'll, I'll read them out whenever we get to one of these. This is, this is a group of gray fox uh, pups or kits. Um, and these were on Pelee Island, which is one of the only places where this species uh, breeds in Ontario. So it's a very rare, very rare species in the province. And I have to say, pretty, pretty darn cute, uh, as most baby mammals are. Okay, so at the NHIC, um, we talk a lot about rare species. Um, there's lots of other things that go on. Um, that feed into this rare species stuff that we deal with. Um, but a lot of what we what we do focuses in on these rare species. We do other things than just talk about rare species, but um, this this tends to be the focus of a lot of our work. So the NHIC, I'm gonna keep calling it NHIC, but it stands for Natural Heritage Information Center. Um, our sort of slogan not that we have an official slogan, but we, we like to set, think of ourselves as an organization, a unit um, that's working with conservation partners to track Ontario's biodiversity. So um, we've got a we got a photo here of Lakeside Daisy, which is a globally rare 
plant species not found in Prince Edward County, unfortunately. You got to go up to Bruce Peninsula and Manitoulin Island to see this one. Um, but this is one of many rare species and uh, rare species that we keep track of in the province. And we, we can't do it without conservation partners um, across the province. So who are we? The, who is the NHIC? So we are a small unit within the science and research branch of the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry, formerly Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, formerly Ministry of Natural Resources, and we've got other former names as well. <clears throat> we, we like, we, uh, a lot of you will just know us as MNR or MNRF, um, but that's, that's the ministry that NHIC is a part of. Um, we're, we're actually a very small unit. There's only about a dozen of us currently, but we are actually hiring right now, which is pretty exciting. So we're, we're growing our team um, up to about 15 right now. So we're a small unit, but we like to, we, we like to think that we do important stuff. Now, the, the really cool thing about being within the NHIC is we are a part of um, the provincial government within the Ontario Public Service and the, the ministry. Um, but we're also part of a network uh, called the NatureServe Network. And this is a network of 82 programs and we, we span the Western hemisphere. There's uh, natural heritage programs in basically all the Canadian provinces and all the American states. And then a lot of the, the Central and South American countries have natural heritage programs as well. So because we've got, um, we're, because we're part of this greater network, we're able to tap into the resources of that network. So um, we collectively are able to track many, many more species um, across the Western hemisphere. And we're able to compare, uh, we're basically able to compare notes with the other programs across the Western hemisphere. So this is really important because it allows us to um, to not just keep tabs on things from an Ontario focus, but we can we can look at sort of the big picture and how how a species is doing. Um, you know, here is it similar to how it's doing uh, in our neighboring provinces and states? How is it doing on its entire range? Um, so it really gives us a lot of power, and it also gives us a lot of resources in terms of we have standardized methodology that all of us follow. So we're not all sort of reinventing the wheel by doing the work we're doing. We're all able to tap into the work of, of others that are doing similar work for keeping track of uh, rare species and ecosystems of conservation concern. But one of the main purposes, um, main roles of the NHIC is really to maintain a database of where plant, where rare plants and animals are found, and where rare plant communities and other special features are found across the province, uh, and then that information then is used by all sorts of other uh, conservation partners to make conservation planning decisions. So, when you think about um, the life cycle, sort of 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 information about rare species and rare plant communities. Um, we're sort of involved in all steps of that of that life cycle of the data. So we're involved um, in the collecting of that data, where those species are found. Um, but that's just one part um, of the cycle that we're involved in. We also then take the information um, and transform it into useful products and visualizations. And in other words, we are able to provide meaning to that information with the goal of eventually being able to protect and sustain our species and ecosystems for future generations. So a lot of what we do involves uh, collecting and managing information about where rare species are found and where, um, where rare plant communities or other special features are found. And some of it is, is involves going out and, and collecting the information ourselves, but a lot of it is gathering information from other data sources and partners and sort of compiling it into one central uh, resource. So in the past, 
we we used to get a lot of our information from these old school or traditional sources of information. Um, so it was things like museum specimens, uh, literature records, and other information from from researchers. Um, and then, of course, lots of information came in the past, especially from field surveys by professional biologists, and that includes biologists at the NHS, as well as others within the provincial government. Um, we would get information from uh, professional biologists with conservation authorities, with the federal government, all sorts. Uh, these were really our two main sources of information in the past. And uh, just to, for a little trivia for you, um, one of our oldest records in our database is, is that of a timber rattlesnake, and it came from the diary of a medic from the War of 1812 in the Niagara Gorge. So um, we've got, literally, we have records from over 200 years ago in our database. More recently, um, citizen science is playing an increasing role uh, in terms of where the information is coming from. So this is this is for a number of reasons. Um, one of the biggest reasons is just that there's a lot more citizen science data out there. Um, and, and that's because we've got all these amazing tools that have all come sort of all at once, right? We've got um, internet available on our phones. We've got um, all sorts of resources that are available at your fingertips. And the, your phone is really just this amazingly powerful uh, data collection tool that's being put to, to use. Um, through a lot of these citizen science programs. So you've got right in your phone, you, you know, think about what you've got. You've got a GPS, you've got maps, you've got resources on how to identify species. You've got access instantly to experts. Um, and you've got, a, in some cases, a pretty amazing camera. So you, you've got all those specialized tools that are not necessarily meant for citizen science related to monitoring species works really well um, with with these programs and as a result we're getting just an amazing amount of information so much so that uh, in in our in the NHIC database currently uh, citizen science observations they make up about half of all observations you know that percentage goes up a, a lot every year so it's only becoming more and more important and it's it's just amazing to see um, this data coming in uh, at a regular, you know, every year we're getting more and more information and it's amazing the gaps that uh, citizen science is able to fill in for us. Okay, now I've got a, a couple uh, pie charts and I apologize for the small font, uh, but this is just a look at what species groups our data represents. Um, and it's really give you the idea yeah, that we track all sorts of different rare species. So the two biggest chai pie, uh, the orange up in the top right, that's bird at 27%. And then the big one is reptiles and amphibians at 35%. Um, plants is the dark blue, 20%. Mammals is the light blue on the left, percent Fish represent 5% in gray. And then arthropods up at the, the top sort of medium blue percent and moss is one percent. So we cover huge taxonomic range, we track over a couple thousand species, rare species province, and then got the whole range from, from birds to plants to reptiles and amphibians and invertebrates. So we, we track a lot of different species. And we the nice thing is our, our data um, comes from a whole range of those species. We're not getting bird information, for instance. We're getting a bunch of stuff on all these different. So um, the biggest chunk, as I said, was citizen science at, at over 40%. That's the big orange one. And then the next biggest chunk comes from, um, you know, provincial government agencies like uh, like the Ministry of Northern Development Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, so the, the other ones that come from uh, the next, the next most important chunk is, other, is sort of 
various agencies like non-government organizations and universities, municipalities, things like that. So we do get information from a wide variety of sources on a wide variety of species. Um, but I really just wanna stress just how important it is for us to get citizen science uh, data coming in from individuals or groups. So the idea um, with the citizen science and really just any contributions in terms of species observations coming into the NHIC is really the idea of you know doing things at a really local individual level and that those those small contributions when they're put together um, with those contributions of, of other people and other organizations other levels of government it really starts to impact um, it really starts to impact conservation initiatives at every every level. Um, you know, you've got at the sort of local level, you've got impacts to stewardship and land tax incentives and municipal planning. And as you as you move down the scale, you start impacting uh, status assessments of species. Uh, you start impacting landscape scale conservation planning. Uh, we've got this general status of wild species in Canada where we assess the status of all species in the country every five years. Um, and then even at the global level, we're, we're making an impact. And it's, it's really hard to understate how important every little observation is to putting together as complete of, picture, of a picture as possible uh, when we're talking about species conservation, species conservation planning. So that is, a uh, really quick, in a nutshell, explanation of what NHIC does um, in terms, terms of the importance of, of compiling information about where rare species are found uh, and the importance of citizen science towards that. Uh, the staff at NHIC, we, we spend a lot of time working with the data, um, you know, making sure everything makes sense. We review all the information that gets sent to us. And we're doing, we're we're compiling it, and we're 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 doing a lot of things with the data uh, before it's made available to other conservation organizations for conservation planning. Um, we do get to do some um, targeted field surveys ourselves to sort of fill in priority gaps, but a lot of the information now, as I said, is coming from citizen science projects. Um, and, and that's why the, the rest of today, I'm gonna talk about uh, these two projects, which I know a lot of you know about already, um, but I'm gonna talk about eBird for a bit, and then I'm gonna switch over to iNaturalist, and then I'll wrap it back up, coming back to talk about the NHIC again. So eBird, uh, and I, I'm gonna go through these slides fairly quick because I know, uh, I know the PEC FN is a pretty big fan of eBird, and I, I know I've even been there before, although I was a little, a little disturbed to hear that that was almost 10 years ago, Sheila. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it. Um, but so eBird is, is something familiar to a lot of you. It's this global citizen science project, and it's absolutely massive when it comes to bird reporting. Um, I got the Ontario stats from last year up there. So we had 25,000 people submit observations to eBird and almost seven and a half million individual bird observations. So it's, it's absolutely gigantic. And it's all run by, by volunteers in terms of reporting um, and the review in Ontario. It's the single biggest source of, of information for species observations um, for the NHIC. Uh, and it's amazing the stuff that we're learning with with eBird data coming out. So why why should we even care about birds and what people are reporting through eBird? Uh, well, well, birds can be used as bioindicators to help assess the health of the ecosystem. Um, they're really ideal in this in this way for a lot of reasons. Um, for lots of reasons, things like they occupy nearly all habitats. You can go pretty much anywhere in the, in the province, especially, and you're gonna find some birds. They fill all different sort of niches. Um, some of them are plant eaters, some of them are insect eaters, some of them are feed on other birds and, and mammals and fish. 
Um, some of them are known to concentrate pesticides and chemical loads, but most importantly, they're really visible to the public. To there's a there's a huge number of people who are interested in birds already, and they're already being counted. So eBird is really just about getting those counts and those observations into a standardized database. But eBird really does three things. Uh, and it does them really well. So it, it gathers that information through these checklists, eBird checklists. Uh, it's a really easy to use tool for gathering those, those observations. Um, it does a, the second thing it does is it archives that information. So we have a, a sort of permanent record of, of what people were, were seeing. And we then are, have a tool to disseminate the information to the public. So eBird does those three things really well. Um, and if you're not familiar with eBird and haven't spent much time with it, if you're interested in birds at all, I highly recommend checking it out. So an eBird is really just on a completely different scale from any other bird citizen science project that we've seen before. Um, just to, to give you some numbers, um, you know, Christmas bird count, there's about 6 million records since it started over a hundred years ago. Um, so if you can remember, I said there were seven and a half million records last year in Ontario alone. So it's just on a completely different scale. Um, breeding bird survey is also another really important program for, for monitoring bird populations. Um, and it's got about, you know, close to 10 million, million records. So eBird's about the same amount just last year alone. And then the breeding bird atlas, the, the second atlas, um, which ran from 2001 to 2005, had about 3,500 contributors, um, contribute about a million records. We're into year to the third breeding bird atlas now, and we're, we're gonna blow year atlas two out of the water, I think, but we're still, uh, eBird is still on another sort of scale. And eBird is different from, from those other programs because it's global, because it's every species, it's year round, and it, it ties all the records to a specific place on the earth. Um, so you're reporting your species at basically this place you saw it, at least at the checklist level. And because eBird is so broad, it's able to support a broad range of skills. So you don't have to be an expert birder to be able to use eBird. You just have to know how to identify some birds and report, report accurately what you're seeing. So eBird's got some differences and as I said, it's just kind of mind boggling the number of, of eBird records there are. Um, these are the growth in time for Ontario uh, eBird use. And so you can see we, you know, we were over, um, we were over 800,000 checklists last year and over 25,000 users. So huge amount. And the really cool thing that you can see in this graph is you can see the huge increase in activity uh, since the pandemic. It's really, birding in general, I think has really taken off and eBird has seen that increase big time. So eBird's got all these, um, all these tools built in that, that sort of incentivize people to, to use it. Uh, and, and that's sort of the, the carrot that eBird offers. So it keeps that for you, like how many species you've seen in your life or in a different place. Um, so it keeps all those stats for the user. And that's, that's a sort of a benefit to using eBird. So you benefit by putting your information in. It's also got these user rankings. So you can see how you're doing compared to other users in terms of how many checklists you've entered or how many species you've seen. And that's another one of these incentives that eBird offers to try to get more people using it, the platform. So a lot of people always ask them, so what happens to all that information uh, that eBird collects? Uh, and basically it's combined into a place called the, with the Avian Knowledge Network, where it's combined with data from other sources. Uh, and then it's made available to researchers and government agencies and, and places like the NHIC um, to be able to use it for conservation and, and research. So it's, you know, it's it's pretty cool to see the intersection of you know, birding as a fun hobby to how those observations can then contribute for conservation purposes. 
So, and eBird, as I said, it's got all these amazing data visualization tools. Um, it's got these bar charts that tell you how likely you are to see a species at a given area. It's got amazing species maps where you can see what's been, where, where a species is. And you can do more sort of advanced uh, explorations like check out what's happening with common red bulls from year to year uh, in terms of they're being good. So you can see changes a species abundance uh, or frequency of report over time. So there's lots of cool tools you can use right built into eBird. Now the eBird data, um, it's being used for all sorts of purposes at this point. Um, it's being used for things like the state of America's birds, state of Canada's birds, I guess bird conservation report. Uh, there, there's literally hundreds of different papers that eBird data now, uh, you know, probably like yearly hundreds of papers now. It's, it's got so much information, it's kind of endless what we can learn from it. Um, there's a, now a whole section on the eBird website called eBird Science. Um, and there's these built-in uh, maps that show you status and trends uh, maps for different species. So there's all the information we're learning um, eBird data. There's some pretty cool stuff like, um, like these animated maps that show, for, sort of for the first time really, um, we're able to look at a species range at sort of the global level and see what's happening with the species at any given time of the year, uh, where we could only in the past sort of piece together the pieces uh, to get a picture, but now able to, to get in real time where the species found. So, you know, in this magnolia where we can see here, you know, with amazing detail, we are able to see what's its breeding range, where it's its found migration, and where is it's found in, in winter. There's lots more um, really, really exciting science coming out of eBird. Um, there was a paper a couple of years ago that came out. Uh, and it looked at how can we use eBird compare to the breeding bird survey data. And this is really important because the breeding bird survey is sort of our baseline data on what has happened in the past with bird populations in North America. And the only downside to the breeding bird survey is it only goes back to basically the mid 1960s. And with eBird, we have the potential to put in Oracle data into the database and start looking at trends going back past the 1960s. And first step to was to make, we were able to sort of match the BBS trend, reading bird survey trends. And these papers have shown uh, pretty, pretty strongly that you can use eBird data to model population which raises the possibility that we might be able to model these populations going back even further than 1960 and really get a handle on how things have, have changed and how things continue to change. And I, and I mentioned earlier that eBird is now the single biggest source for NHIB information on species at risk. So we're getting more, more information about where these rare species are found than we ever have. Um, you can just imagine, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that NAP has about 15 and half, and uh, there's only so many places we can go in, say, in a given year. So when we've got potentially 25,000 volunteer citizen scientists reporting their observations to a place like uh, just, it just just it's order, orders of magnitude uh, of what coverage we can get especially for well-surveyed speed groups like birds. So I know you are all on eBird already. Um, and if you needed any more incentive to use it, I hope I just provide it. So I'm gonna shift over to iNatural now. Uh, iNatural is a little newer than eBird. Um, it was started in 2008. And it's coordinated by the California Academy of Scientists of Science. Um, 
unlike it's got some differences from eBird. So the, the one big difference is it's all species. So it's not just about birds. It's you can report plants, you can report butterfly, whatever you want. Um, it's rapidly growing. It's kind of catching up to eBird in terms of its popularity. Um, and then the other big difference between eBird and iNaturalist, eBird is about doing the surveys and you report the checklist of what you see, whereas iNaturalist is all single observations. It's all, the real focus is on photo. So almost every record in iNaturalist has a photo and it's really just like, I saw this piece at this spot on this time. And here's a photo to prove it kind of thing. So because it's all photo-based, there's a community review instead of volunteer reviewers with eBird, there's this community review where it's 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 more like you post a sighting and the community kind of agrees or suggests alternative. And it works really well on your phone um, if you download the, the iNaturalist app. So just like eBird, um, it's got these user rankings as, as sort of an incentive to get people to use use it and submit observations more frequently. Um, so you can look at, um, you know, how many observations you've submitted compared to other people or how many species you've reported, all sorts of things like that. Um, and like eBird, it has had this tremendous growth, um, especially in the last four or five years or so. Um, at the NHIC, I think we started we started using iNaturalist really in about 20, uh, 2016. So it was just starting to take off in Ontario when we started using iNaturalist. Um, and it's been amazing to see it grow to the point that we had almost 1.2 million observations submitted to iNaturalist in Ontario last year. And that was by about a uh, little over 30,000 different people reported stuff. So about the same number of people using it as use eBird. Um, but it's really kind of incredible when you think about it, that each one of those observations has a photo pretty much. So um, it's a pretty amazing resource um, of just of the photos on, on its own. Um, so this one's another tougher one to see, I apologize. But these are two bar charts that show what's the breakdown in iNaturalist for Ontario of the different taxonomic groups by the number of observations on the left and number of species on the right. So um, insects make up a big chunk of both total observations and total species. Um, that's the gray, that's the gray pie, chart, uh, pie piece. About 370,000 observations were insects when I did this and about 6,000 species. Um, so almost half the species reported in iNaturalist were insects. The next big chunk are plants at 400,000 observations when I last checked uh, and about 3,600 species. So those are the two big chunks. And if you think about the fact that most of the iNaturalist observations are collected by people with their, with their phones, uh, that makes sense. Plants and insects are both pretty easy to photograph with your phone. Um, but it does cover the entire spectrum. So, um, you know, birds, other inverts, uh, fish, mammals, fungi, lichens, reptiles, amphibians are all represented in, in great numbers with iNaturalist. Now, just like eBird, you can use iNaturalist as a learning tool. Um, you can find out about a particular species. Here, I've got the harvester butterfly. Um, and the little chart at the bottom, it's kind of like the equivalent of an eBird bar chart. It shows you uh, when most of the sightings have come in, what time of the year. So you can see if you were looking for uh, a harvester, you'd want to probably focus your efforts in June or July, maybe in August, or, or at the peak of when it's been reported. You can get other information on the, the species page. Um, like who's seen the most or who's identified the most, how many total observations are there, things like that. And just like eBird, you can go and look on a map to see where various species have been seen. So here's the map for a harvester and you can see it's really been found throughout the sort of southern two thirds of the province. So one of the, one of the tools that NHIC has 
that relates to iNaturalist is there's these things called projects within iNaturalist. And anybody can start a project, um, but you to really take advantage, you need people to join your projects um, in order to get some of the benefits. So um, NHIC started this project about rare species of Ontario uh, back in March, 2017. Um, and we've sort of gradually had the project grow. We've had a bit of an effort to try to get people to join, but it's mostly been kind of organic um, and people just sort of hearing about the project and wanting you know, genuinely wanting to contribute their their data to the project. And so by putting records in and joining the project, um, people's observations then are really easy for us to grab and incorporate into the NHIC database. So um, just some, some stats since March of 2017. So we're co coming up on five years. We've got over 100,000 observations in the project. Um, of 2,300 rare species that we track, and we have 1,500 people that have joined the project. So by joining the project, the cool thing is you don't even need to know if you've, if you've observed a species, you don't have to know if it's one of the species we track. Um, when you join the project, then, and you, if you give us the permission, then we'll just automatically grab any record that's one of the species that we track. So it's a really easy way for people to um, you know, you're just adding your observations to iNaturalist and having joined our project, then automatically any of the rare species get added into this project and then we can grab them out at a regular, regular intervals and incorporate them into our database. So the other advantage, some of the other advantages that we really like about this, this tool for us is the records get sort of vetted by the community first, the community of iNaturalist users. And then we're able to pull them out and then we do our sort of secondary NHIC expert review. Um, so we, we have really high faith that uh, the records that we get out of iNaturalist are some of the highest quality records because they've gone through sort of two reviews, um, which is really amazing for us. And of course, they're all geo-referenced or, or another way to say it is they all have the coordinates. So it makes it easy for us to integrate them into our database. So we've we've found out lots of amazing stuff um, through citizen science projects like eBird, like iNaturalist. I'm going to share a few of the cool discoveries that have been made um, using this sort of information from citizen scientists. So the first one is this species of beetle called the ghost tiger beetle. Um, and this is a species that's, it's pretty hard to see. Um, it really blends in really well with, with like white, really pale sand. That's where it tends to be found. Um, and hence the name ghost tiger beetle. Um, and in Ontario, it has a conservation status rank of S2, which is imperiled. Um, S1 being the rarest kind of rank we can give a species. Um, and this species is a candidate species to be reviewed by COSIWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So it doesn't have any of those, it's not, on a, not a species at risk, uh, but it's a species that's gonna be considered for, for that status at some point in the future, perhaps. Um, so we've got this species. We knew of a handful of places where it was found um, previously through, you know, professional surveys, through our own surveys. But since putting this, you know, since iNaturalist came out and we had this species as one of our rare species that we were getting information on, um, we've probably about doubled the number of sites we knew about where the species was found, which isn't too many. Like we only knew about five to 10 sites previously, but uh, pretty amazing that we've been able to about double the number of known sites for the species, thanks to observations loaded into iNaturalist and our iNaturalist project. Another really cool story is this one. This is the Eastern Pond Mussel. Uh, and this is a species that's endangered under the Endangered Species Act, um, has a conservation status rank of S1, which is critically imperiled in Ontario. And this species is one that you really have to know. Uh, I mean, freshwater mussels are a hard group. Not that many people know them. Um, so you have to know the species pretty well, um, and they're hard to identify. 
So usually it takes pretty specialized survey effort to go and look for this species. Uh, but but there's a there was a, some observations put into iNaturalist um, for a species for a, a site in Lake Ontario, further west than Prince Edward County. Um, so there were some observations loaded in, and it was from a site we did know about, but nobody had surveyed that site. No professional biologist had been there since 2012. Um, so we had some new observations made by, as it turned out, uh, a teacher who happens to like snorkeling for freshwater mussels and taking photos of them. So we had these observations that we might not have ever known about, um, loaded into iNaturalist and then brought into the project. And I was able to fill really important gaps um, in our knowledge for, uh, for recovery efforts for the species. Okay, and this is my last discovery um, discovery example. This one is, I think, one of the coolest stories of, of how iNaturalist is, has helped us learn about species and rare species. Um, this species is called the painted hand mud bug, uh, and it is a species of crayfish. And is, as it turns out, we did not know about the species in the province until about four or five years ago. Uh, and, and one of our NHIC staff photographed this species um, down in Windsor, and they thought it was a more, one of the, it, we, they thought it was a different species uh, called the devil crayfish, which looks really similar. Um, so they put the observation up on iNaturalist and uh, a little while later, uh, crayfish, uh, an expert on this particular group of crayfish um, came along and said, well, you know what, that's actually, this very similar species called the painted hand mud bug, um, which we didn't know existed in Ontario. So that's pretty awesome. And so, you know, we had some more back and forth. And since then, we've actually had that uh, crayfish expert into the province to do um, specialized surveys. He has taught NHIC staff how to survey for this species. And we were where we're, we've been in the process of collecting information about where else it's found, where it's not found. Uh, and this is a species that is currently in the process of being assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Um, so it may get a formal species at risk status given to it. Uh, but all that, just because we put up a photo in a place, iNaturalist, where there's, there's these experts uh, in different, different fields um, that are looking for, for information. So pretty cool discovery, I have to say. Okay, so um, to kind of wrap things up, um, just wanted to make sure I get a point across some what I think are important points. So citizen science, it's been around for a long time and it's always been really important to, to our ministry, to the NHIC in terms of tracking rare species. Uh, but it's really taken off, uh, especially with mobile devices, mobile technologies, internet, all that stuff has really helped citizen science take off. Um, and that's, that's really allowing us to, to leverage all these new tools that are out there in order to really engage the full spectrum of people that are out there that are already making these, find, these discoveries and finds and, and able to tap into that information and better our understanding of our natural resources. Um, and it's actually a really great way for us to cost effectively um, all be involved in the monitoring of biodiversity in our province. So um, how can you get involved? So uh, if you have a large data set, um, you can contact us uh, I've got our email address, nhicrequests at ontario.ca. If you have large data sets about where rare species or rare plant communities or special features are found, contact us. Um, we, can, we can work out a, a good way to get it to us. Um, but if you're making individual observations, which I know all the people on this call regularly are doing, um, submit those records to some of the, the different citizen science platforms out there, iNaturalist, eBird, the Butterfly Atlas, uh, the Odinate Atlas, eButterfly. We regularly at the NHIC, we regularly grab information from all these different places um, and compile them into the NHIC's database 
where they can ultimately uh, make an impact for conservation and species, species conservation and biodiversity monitoring. So that's, that's it for my slides. Uh, I hope I didn't go too long, uh, but I'm able to take some questions if there are any. I'm just gonna close this. So, hi, Mike, this is Jerry speaking. Um, so first of all, that was fantastic. And I will thank you more formally later. Um, I'm gonna encourage everyone to send in questions. We only have two so far, and I know there are more out there. So Mike, first question from Amy Bodman. Are you getting fish data from citizen scientists? Yeah, good question. Uh, we do. We definitely do. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, iNaturalist is the biggest place where we get citizen science fish information. Um, and we definitely get, we definitely get data on fish. Um, yeah, I'm regularly reviewing all the fish that we get and there's not that many species we track that are easy to identify. That's sort of the one barrier for, for rare fish in the province. A lot of them are, you know, species of minnows that you really have to be an expert or pretty close to it. Um, but some of the other species we, we get, you know, um, lake sturgeon and American eel are, are two that we get a lot of reports um, through iNaturalist and other places. But yeah, we definitely get, we get everything through citizen science for sure. So encouraging all fisher men and women to take photos for our naturalists and send them up. And uh, from Brian Jarrell to everyone, is I naturalist only interested in reports of rare species? Yeah, good question. Um, no. So I naturalist, uh, and, and I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about how I naturalist works, but it's about everything. We just happen to have that NHIC project in iNaturalist where we're grabbing out those rare species. But there's there's all it's being used. The data in iNaturalist is being used for all sorts of different purposes. Uh, for example, Parks has has projects in for all of their properties, and so they're using it just as a sort of baseline, um, helping them generate their species lists. So, and that includes everything, not just rare species at all. Um, so yeah, the report everything and then. If it turns out it's a rare species, then uh, then and if, if you join the NHIC project, we'll get those information. But otherwise, it's still available for other purposes than just NHIC. We're just one tiny little sort of fish using the, the data right now. Um, the, the other thing I didn't mention about iNaturalist that's really great with the, especially with common species, is it has this built-in feature where it, if you put in a photo, it will actually suggest to you what it is. So even if you don't know what it is, it'll give you some suggestions. And it's pretty incredible how accurate it is. Um, I actually once, my, my favorite example of trying to stump it, I took a photo, I found a turkey foot uh, in my driveway. I think a coyote got it once. I took a picture of this turkey foot and I thought there's no way iNaturalist is gonna figure out what this is. And its first guess was uh, earthworm, was an earthworm. But its second guess was wild turkey, which kind of floored me. Um, so yeah, play around with it. It's a good time to try it out. If you've got a phone or a tablet, just try it on like some trees in your backyard or something um, and, and get used to using it just with your common backyard things once, especially once flowers are out and insects come out. Yeah. And that's what I've been using it for actually, mainly for wildflowers and it's identified everything for me. And my photos are not great. Um, so from John Foster, does eBird and iNaturalist accept older or historical records? Yeah, another great question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can go in uh, to either of those platforms and, and put anything in. I think eBird limits you to 1800 as the earliest you can put in records from, but uh, I, don't think, I don't think anybody has too many records going back past that far anyways. Okay, thanks. And from Paul Jones, who gave us our last fantastic uh, members meeting presentation, 
Um, thanks for a great talk. I'm very interested in eBird's data visualization tools. Are they open for the general public to use? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, the ones that all the ones that I showed are available to to the public. The um, the eBird Science tab. If you're just, I can even just pull it up here. I'll share my screen real quick. So if we're on eBird and you click the Science tab, there it's a little slow because I'm trying to I'm trying to share my screen as well. Um, this is where you can add a lot of these visualization tools. Uh, of course, the the bar charts and the basics are found under the Explore tab. But under eBird Science, there's all these different tools. Um, there's this cool new one called Shorebird Viz that you can check out. But a lot of stuff that uh, I think is really cool, eBird status trends. So we can find any species. Let's let's try wood thrush. That's not, not loading up here for me. Uh, my internet's just a little slow here. Let's, let's find species here on Ontario species. So they don't have any species done yet. Uh, let's see here. All right, let's try Ruby Crown King. Oh, well, they've got they've got a bunch of different maps. Some of them are animated, so you can look at the abundance animation as an example. And we can push play. My my internet is just a little topping out on its max max stuff right now. It's not doesn't load for me. Oh, here it comes. There we go. Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, you can spend several days just browsing through these maps and, and different visualizations. Thank you. That's amazing. Actually, all this data and turned into such valuable information. And from uh, Paula Peel, do you find it harder to get info on nocturnal species, e.g. bats, owls, etc., since phones don't work as well at night? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Definitely, I mean, from a bird perspective, yeah, the nocturnal species are definitely, I would say, under-surveyed. Um, and we have, we have some specific protocols, um, specific, sorry, not protocols, specific citizen science projects geared towards those nocturnal species. So um, in Ontario, we have the Ontario Nocturnal Owl Survey, uh, and then we also have the Ontario Nightjar Survey, or the Canadian Nightjar Survey, sorry. Um, so those are two protocols that are always looking for volunteers, and they are really focused um, survey protocols um, for those those groups of nocturnal birds and it's another those are another data source that we get information for um, for those nocturnal species there's some similar things for bats but they're bats are harder because you, you, you need again you need some expertise with the identification there's some you know there's some technology that can help but it's only it's only so good for confirming some of those species uh, mm -hmm. but definitely the thing with the thing to keep in mind with citizen science is like it's sort of a shotgun blast where we get a whole bunch of information it's not collected necessarily in any particular way it's not it's wherever people want to go um so it's really great for us um at nhic because we get all that information and then we can say okay this is what we've got through all these citizen science tools what are we missing and then we can really focus in our efforts you know, if there's a species or an area that's really under surveyed, then we can focus that little bit of field time that we do have. You know, there's only four or five of us or six of us that are going to go out and do those surveys. But instead of going and collecting information about eastern meadowlarks, um, we can say, okay, meadowlarks have been surveyed well with citizen science already. So let's go focus in on this, this other rare species 
that we don't have good information for. So that's what's so amazing about citizen science information for me, because it lets me focus in on those, those gaps. Okay, thank you. Um, so a bit of feedback from Paul Jones here. Thanks, that is super helpful. That was about the animation. Elaine Jackson to everybody, is feedback available to the contributors of information regarding confirmation of identification of what they've submitted? Yeah, great question, Elaine. Um, so I, I, it's sort of different between the two platforms I talked about. So for eBird, um, so the way the data review works within eBird is we've got these automated filters basically in place. So based on expected likelihood at that place in that time, um, you'll try to submit a sighting. And if it's, if it's rare for that area or that time of year, then you'll be asked to put in details to, to support the identification. If you have a photo, you can put that in. And then you might get contacted by the volunteer reviewer who reviews the information. Um, it really depends on the situation. Um, if you, you know, if you put in a photo and it's misidentified, for sure you would get a, you, they should contact you and say, oh, well, you know, actually it's this similar species. Um, in iNaturalist, it's, it's really right out in the open. So if you, and it's different because you've got a photo for every record basically. So you put in your photo, you can say whatever you think it is. And then maybe somebody comes along, maybe somebody doesn't, but if somebody comes along and, and adds an identification, they're either gonna agree with you, they're gonna suggest a more fine scale identification. So maybe you put it in and you said, oh, it's a butterfly. I don't know what kind of butterfly, but it's a butterfly. They might come along and say, well, it's actually a monarch, a, sp a particular species. So they can improve your ID um, and then they can also disagree. And so you'll, ex you'll see exactly what they think they think it is. You'll see their suggestion. Um, and then somebody else can come along and say, oh no, actually Elaine was right. It, it looks more like this species. So it's, it's really like this community effort to try to get the identification as correct as possible. Hmm. Well, thank you. So I think we've come to the end of the questions. Oh no, Lee Squat, this is a comment. Thanks for the great presentation. I appreciate all the information on citizen science options. And from Elaine, thank you. So I'm gonna echo Lisa's uh, comment here and, and add more, that it was just an amazing presentation, Mike, and I had no idea um, how much data is out there and what, great use is made of it. I will certainly join your NHIC iNaturalist project. <laughs> Not that my great. photos are great, but, uh, but I really have appreciated the, uh, the identification. Uh, so thank you for everything you do and everything for being such a good friend to Peckman. And uh, we have a little gift bag for you. Uh, bag made by uh, by Myrna, it's a lovely bag, and, and uh, full of a few goodies for you and Erica, is it, to uh, to enjoy. So Thank we'll you. figure out how we'll figure out how to get that to you. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> I, I'm sure I can be convinced to come down down sometime and 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 uh, maybe do a little birding. Great. Well, we'll work on that. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. And I think Amy is going to be back in a sec. I'm unmuted now. Okay, <laughs> I have to change my view here so I know what's going on. Um, okay, can everybody hear me? Is that okay? Great. Okay, Mike, that was terrific. I did want to add something. You know, when we were trying to get, we were trying to protect the um, hillier wetlands, you know, trying to get Hubs Creek, we got it upgraded to a PSW. And then a couple of years later, we got Slab Creek updated. And I believe the thing that the species that changed the upgrading for Slab Creek was a redheaded woodpecker, which had been from data that Terry Sprague had seen that I can't remember who it was who entered it into to, um, eBird for it, but it was because of that that we were able to get the, the designation upgrader, at least that's how I, I'm sure there are many other factors too, but that was the species that sealed the deal 
So that was really great. So there you get, although many times when we're out birding and I'm not a great e-birder user, which I'm sure you know, but um, a lot of people say e-bird's not gonna like this. Like if we see something in one place, oh, eBird's not going to like it. So that is one of the one of the one of the things we say when we go birding. But anyway, that that was a terrific talk. Thank you so much, it, and it was great to see you again on Zoom. And thank you for everything you've done for PECFEN and for our area. So thanks. Okay, so that um, that concludes our meeting. I want to just remind everybody that um, our next our next meeting won't be a members meeting, but a special presentation on the restoration of Waring's Creek on March 22nd. We'll send out a notice about it and, and um, that'll be at seven o'clock again via Zoom. And then a week later on March 29th, we'll have Tim Johnson talk about the ecology and history of the American eel on Lake Ontario, which should be really interesting too. So I just wanna remind everybody, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks again, Mike. And I hope everybody has a good rest of the month and a good evening. All right. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming, Mike. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Okay, good night, Elaine. <laughs> Thank you for everything you are doing, especially at the county level. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Elaine. Jeez. <laughs> it's been I know what an uphill battle it is. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Elaine. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Say hi to Gord too, please. Okay. Yeah, he's right here. He's right here. He's right here. Oh, good night, Gord. There's your hand. Great. Okay. Good night. Take care of you too. He can't see you much anymore, but he's here listening. Excellent. That's terrific. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night, you too. Take care. Yeah.